Hi there trailer owners. Today we're going to be taking a look at Cody X disc brake kit. This kit is designed for 8,000 pound axles. You get a 13 inch rotor with an eight on six and a half bolt pattern. It's available in either a raw finish like you see here or a dichromate finish. The kit comes with a full setup for one axle. So if you have multiple axles on your trailer, you can pick up as many kits as you need. Disc brakes are gonna give you superior performance over your typical drum brakes that come on your trailer. This is mainly due to having increased surface area. Our pads here squeeze on each side. We get, we get really good contact. With shoes, as the shoes spread out, you normally only get a little bit of contact on each side of the shoe. If you've ever taken them apart after they've worn down, you'll see they're significantly worn, usually on like the tops or the bottoms, but not on the other side because you don't get that much surface area contact. That's going to decrease your stopping distance since we're gonna have more stopping power here with these brakes. And since these use a hydraulic setup, you get a smoother brake application so it feels more natural when you're stopping. These are also going to be less maintenance than what your drum brakes are gonna be. Drum brakes, even though most of them say that they are self-adjusting, the self-adjusters on them, they just, they just don't typically work as well as you would like them to. They sound great in theory, but a lot of times they only adjust when backing your trailer up. And you usually need to do a pretty good back up and stop to make the adjuster wheel even adjust. And there's a lot of situations under normal driving that you're just not gonna get that and it's just not going to adjust and you're gonna have to do it manually. There's also a lot more parts inside of your drum brake system. So if you do take it apart, you have to do any repairs. It's a lot more work than with our setup here. Here we've got the old drums that we had removed from it. And you can see it's got all these parts in it. You've got your magnet here for the electronic brakes. You've got multiple springs. And when this one came off, when I took the hub off, the spring was actually sitting inside there. And you can see here where it started to chew up on our shoe. All these parts, I mean, they can fall apart. Again, if you have to put this back together and stuff, you have to get all these springs set up back in the right spot. It's just a big old mess. It's a lot of work and the performance just isn't even close to what it's gonna be with the disc brake system. The only moving part that we've got here is our caliper that squeezes the brake pads together against the rotor using hydraulic pressure. Changing brake pads is easier than changing shoes on a drum brake setup. There's just two bolts and your caliper comes off. They are pre-equipped with caps that work with easy lube axles. So if you do have those, that's really nice. The rubber cap here will just pop out and then you can easily maintain your bearings by greasing them through the opening here. Now bearings don't come included with your rotors, but we've got various kits available here at eTrailer.com. So you can get the appropriate bearing that's gonna match your new rotor as well as the spindle on your axle. The caliper mounting brackets are designed to work with your existing flange so you can reuse your hardware when you take your old drum brake system off. The brake pads that come included with it are gonna be ceramic, so that does help increase the life of the pad. It's gonna be stronger than your traditional brake pads. The rotors do come with the races for the bearings pre-installed in them, so you don't have to worry about driving in any races that's done for you. The bearing kits we have here will just drop right in. And our caliper here does have a very large piston in it, which helps increase the surface area that it, and force pushing against the brake pads, clamping them against our rotor. Here you can see our piston with its two and a half inch diameter. Our brake caliper, as well as our caliper bracket are all E-coated to ensure rust and corrosion doesn't occur on our parts. The bracket is going to be made of a ductile iron and our calipers are gonna be made from a cast iron. The mounting hardware for the caliper is made of a stainless steel. And this is really nice because our caliper does need to slide on these pins here. These bolts don't just hold this solid. The caliper does need to slide on these pins back and forth and that's how it allows itself to clamp and then loosen and keep our brake pads from dragging on either side of the rotor. Sometimes if you have a bolt that's made of other materials that can corrode, it can inhibit the sliding motion and potentially cause your caliper to bind on one side of the rotor, wearing down that pad and decreasing the life. With a stainless steel setup, it's gonna keep that corrosion off of there, so that way it's gonna have nice smooth operation for a long time. Our rotor is also a cast iron, and you can see it's nice machined surface. Now, one of the things you do need to keep in mind when installing a disc brake system is that it does require hydraulic 
pressure to activate the caliper and it does require a higher pressure than what a drum brake system was. So if you are having a drum brake system already on your trailer that is hydraulic, you will likely need to step up the hydraulic pressure to make this system work. I highly recommend Hydrostar's 1600 PSI actuator for this system as the minimum requirements for these is 1500 PSI. This kit's designed for an 8,000 pound axle with a number 42 spindle. It has to have 16 inch or larger wheels. The bolt pattern is going to be an eight on six and a half, so you wanna make sure that fits your wheels. It has a brake flange on the back that uses four bolts, and that's usually your standard. Our wheel studs here are a 9 16 in diameter, so you do wanna keep that in mind as well. You may need to purchase new lug nuts if your old system did not have the same size studs here. Now the install of swapping over your drums to your disc brake setup here really isn't too bad. We're gonna go over that here now. You will need to lift up your trailer. We'll go over safe lifting techniques as well as how to get these assemblies installed. Once you get your brakes installed, you will need hydraulic lines that go to them to power them up. If you don't have that, you can get those here at eTrailer.com. To begin our installation, we are gonna to need to remove our wheels. So to do that, you're gonna to have to have your vehicle jacked up high enough so the wheels are off the ground. When lifting it, you'll wanna make sure you lift it by the frame. And you, we're gonna to need to do this on all four of our wheels. So you can go ahead and lift the whole thing up or you could do one side at a time. It's probably easier if you just lift the whole thing up because this is a pretty big job and we're gonna to need to be underneath. So I'd recommend at each corner on the frame of your trailer, lift, jack it up, and then place jack stands under it to support it where the wheels are off the ground. Now we're on a lift here in the shop, but you could use your leveling jacks at home if you got them installed. If they don't lift them up high enough to get the wheels on the ground, you could always place blocks of wood underneath to make sure you've got one that's large enough to fit the diameter of your pad. Now once you've got it lifted up though, if you do use your leveling jacks, you still want to make sure you have jack stands under the frame because we don't want to trust being underneath the vehicle being supported by hydraulic pressure. We want to have a solid stand underneath. Now that we've got our wheel off though, we just remove the lug nuts and set it aside. One of the things you're gonna notice here is that the cap is missing. On this particular vehicle here, whoever serviced it last, they over tightened the cap. So you can see here where the threads used to be, where it threaded in, they're actually broke off and inside of our hub there. So normally you would just take a pair of channel locks and, or pliers and just undo this. If you've got a socket big enough, you can do that as well, but you just unthread that. Since ours was already broken off though, we need to get ours out of there. We're just gonna use a screwdriver here. These things normally aren't threaded in very tight or anything. You can see it's just gonna spin right out of there. So I'm gonna get this out of the way because with it being threaded in there, it's likely gonna hang up on our bearing when we go to take it out. So we're just gonna get it out now. Now it's no big deal that this one here is broken because we do receive new ones with our brake kit. So we are prepared there. Once you get down here to the outside, it gets a little trickier, but there it goes. It's out of the way so we can move on now. Once you've got your cap off so you can access what's inside here, we'll need to take out the cotter pin that's holding our nut in place. And you can see the pin here. So we're just gonna bend it back up right. And then we can just push that pin out of there. It's gonna come out the bottom. One of the things you can do if you're having a difficult time getting this pin out is the nut's usually not very tight. So you can either spin it by hand or I usually use channel locks just to keep myself from getting dirty. Just a little, we can just move it a little bit, whichever way we need to move it to relieve some pressure on it to make it easier to get the pin out of there. Once the pin is out, we can then remove the nut. Down below on the floor here, I've got a shop towel laid out so I can set all my stuff on it. This keeps you from getting grease all over the place. And it's also nice to have for setting just your parts and tools and stuff on, not only to keep the mess on here, but since this is pretty much just wheel bearing grease, we can also set our other parts on here and that'll keep dirt and other debris from getting into our new parts. So what I like to do is to just pull it out slightly. And you can see our bearing starting to walk its way out. Once you've got it pulled out slightly, we can then take a screwdriver in here and start to pop it out some. We can get it a little bit further. Sometimes you get caught up a little bit on the brake shoes inside, but we're looking to just get it out just enough like this. So we can keep ourselves from getting dirty. We can stick our screwdriver in there 
and then just set it down. We can now take our whole assembly off and it's just gonna pull right off. You may have some dragging on your brake shoes. If you have so much dragging that you can't get the thing off, you may need to go in and loosen up the brakes. But in a lot of cases, they're not gonna be that tight and you're just gonna be able to slide it off like that. Well then, just set this aside as we're not gonna need anything out of that. Minimize mess, we're gonna go ahead and wipe the spindle off here. And you can actually see some of the grease here built up a little bit on the inside. So our grease seal was leaking a little bit on our old brakes. We're gonna get new grease seals with our kit though, so not a big deal there. Four bolts hold our brake assembly on that we're gonna be removing. We're gonna use a three quarter inch socket to remove them. And on the back side, there's gonna be nuts that's also three quarter inch. So we're gonna to wanna to wrench on that side to hold while we take it off. You'll wanna keep this hardware because we are gonna reuse it to attach our new brake components. We're just gonna take the rest of these out now. Now that we've got all the hardware removed, the only thing that's holding our brake assembly on here is the wiring around back where it attaches to the magnet. We're just gonna cut off the wiring from the magnet here. So right there. Cut both of these wires. And now our whole assembly is just gonna come off of there. Sometimes it doesn't come off just quite that easy. You might have to tap it with a little bit of a hammer just to break it loose, because it gets a little stuck around the flange from time to time. So we're gonna go ahead and clean the rest of the grease off of here now. We're just using some brake clean just to get all that off of there, especially since this one had a leaking seal. Just get all that stuff out of the way. We don't want any of this potentially getting onto our rotors and stuff while we're putting things on. We can always clean it off if we do, but minimizing mess just helps keep keep everything a little bit easier going forward. We can now start mounting our new brake hardware on. This is our caliper bracket. This has to go on before we put the rotor on. You'll see here it, does, it is labeled. This is the outside. And the orientation of it is gonna be dependent upon your axles. We've got 8,000 pound axles, so we're gonna put ours at the position that faces towards the rear of our vehicle. So we're gonna be like this. We're then gonna attach it using the hardware that we had just removed to take off our old brakes. If you have a different size axle, you may wanna to refer to the instructions as there may be different orientations to where you need to mount this bracket. We can then go back and tighten on our hardware. Now before we can put our new disc brake rotor on here, we have to have bearings put in it. And we don't wanna reuse our old bearings. The old ones could potentially be damaged. They may not be the right size. You wanna make sure you've got the proper bearings to match your components. If we look at the back side of the inner race on our bearings, we'll have part number information on there. So you'll wanna take the old bearings that you had removed from your old brake system, clean up one of those and get an idea of what the numbers are on it so you can ensure that you know the specs of that bearing. Because what this is gonna provide your old bearing is gonna give you the inside diameter that we need to fit onto our axle spindle. The outside diameter that matches your new brakes, you'll be able to find in the information on our website so you can ensure that you've got the appropriate bearing that's gonna match both your axle as well as your new brake assembly. To be safe, it's a good idea to check your bearings on one of your wheels before placing your order so that way you can ensure you get the correct bearings because nothing sucks more than getting in here to do the brake full job install just to find out you've got the wrong parts and you've ripped everything apart and you can't go back together. So I do recommend just taking one off because you can always put that one back together after you take it off, but you can get the proper numbers to ensure you get the proper parts. We'll now need to pack our bearings. We do have bearing packers available here at eTrailer.com, but I'll show you how you can do it by hand. The big thing we need to do is we need to get grease packed all the way inside here until it comes out the other side there. We're gonna take our grease and we're gonna smoosh it in all the way around. Some people do get irritated with various chemicals and grease. So if you think you have sensitive skin and you're worried about it, I would recommend wearing a pair of gloves. I haven't noticed any issues with mine, but all people are different. So you'll just need to make sure you're doing what's proper for you. And first I'm just gonna start by kind of just getting it around there. Cause then we're gonna be smushing it up inside there. I'm just gonna get, and get it started all the way around. And now the easiest way to usually do this 
is to use the palm of your hand. I'm going to put some grease there and we're just going to smash that grease up inside of it. Just continually smash it. If you need to, you can go a little higher. Just and we're just going to continue doing this until we get grease all the way around the outside. We don't want to have our bearings run dry ever. So this is pretty critical to ensure that when we drive our vehicle, we, are, we have the proper lubrication inside of our bearings. If you don't, it could potentially eat it up. So here you can see that the grease that I've been pushing through on the back side is starting to come out around the seal here at the top. And that's what we want. We want it to be completely packed all the way around. Once you've got the larger bearing done, this is going to be your inner bearing. This one's going to set into the back side of your rotor and we'll put our seal on to put that in. Since I'm all messy right now, might as well take the opportunity to grease your outer bearing. Just once you're done with this one, you want to make sure you set it in a place where it's not going to collect a bunch of dirt while you're finishing up. Now we can put our grease seal in. This is just going to sit right in the back. This is the inside here, so it's going to go towards our bearing. You can see the little spring there. Make sure your spring is in the lip all the way around. It should be when you pull it out. And we're just going to set that in place. And then we're going to drive it in using a seal driver kit. You can get that here at eTrailer.com. If you don't have a seal driver kit, one of the common methods is to just use a block of wood. But I'll show you here why this is not going to necessarily work out in this particular situation. We can start with it for sure like you would any other seal. Because this is a very common automotive practice is to use the block of wood, because most commonly, you drive these seals in until they're flush with the back of the rotor. But with this particular Kodiak kit, one of the things you're gonna notice here is that it's chamfered and our seal's actually not driven all the way in yet. I know most of the time it's tilts flush, but I'm telling you that this is going to have your seal be out just a little bit and it's not going to ride where you would think it would on the inner seal where it goes on the spindle. And it's also not driven all the way in so it could potentially work itself out because we don't have as much surface area as possible holding the seal in. We can then take a seal driver and this is our shops kit so it's a little bit different than what we have online but it works very similarly. We're going to get an appropriate sized driver, line it up with the race, it needs to be basically the same diameter or just a hair smaller. And then we can finish driving it in all the way. And now that we've got it all the way in, you can see we're down flush with that chamfer all the way around. I know some people might get concerned, well, hey, is this gonna push it in far enough to where it's gonna hit our bearing? No, it's not. You can see the bearing still has plenty of room, so that's exactly how we want it there. We're then just going to smear a little bit of fresh grease on here just to make things slide on a little bit easier. All right, at this point we can lift our rotor up. It is heavy, it's a pretty big chunk of metal there. but And then we're going to carefully slide it onto the spindle, being careful not to nick the grease seal that we put in on anything. So we're just going to bring it up. I kind of I like to rotate it around. I kind of watch what I'm doing as I go in and push it in until it stops there. We can then take the new bearing that we already greased and slide that into place. Sometimes these can be a little tricky. That's why we greased it up first to try to make things a little bit easier, but every now and then they just like to get stuck when they're cocked just a little bit. Sometimes that's the case, you can just pull it back out a little bit if it does get stuck. Once you've got the bearing slid in, we can take the old washer that we had. We're just gonna wipe the grease off of that. Now the grease that we did use, we used red wheel bearing grease, which we have available here at eTrailer.com if you need some. We chose red because that's what the old grease was. I know it kind of looks black, that's just because it's dirty. It was actually red once you kind of get down inside of it. So it's best to match the type that you had in there before. We'll then slide the washer on and follow it up with the nut that we had removed as well. We're gonna just wipe off some of that old grease and dirt, just get that out of there. You don't need to get 100% of the old grease out of there, it's not really necessary. But we just wanna get kind of the bulk off of it. And then we're just gonna tighten this back on here. 
And we're just using that same pair of channel locks again to tighten it down. This is where we need to set the pressure on the bearings. So one of the things I like to do first to ensure the bearings are fully seated is tighten it as tight as I can get. So we're turning the nut and we're turning the rotor at the same time. And you're gonna feel the rotor get tight as you do this. Again, we're just trying to make sure we got the bearings fully seated. Once you've got it nice and snug like that, really hard to turn. We don't wanna leave it that way. We'll burn our bearings up, but we know they're fully seated now. Once we've got it fully tightened, we're then just gonna back the nut off to where it's loose. And we're gonna come back until we just feel just a little bit of resistance there, right there. That's, that's about where we start to feel a little pressure. Now we'll see our little hole there. That's where our cotter pin's gonna go back in. Since it's very close to this slot, we're just gonna give it just a smidge like that, and then reinsert our cotter pin. Again, this is gonna probably need just a little bit of adjustment on the nut to get her to go where we need it to go. There we go. So it comes out the other side. Make sure we go all the way down with it. There we go. We got it all the way down. We'll take the other end and bend it back up like it was before. Now we can finish greasing these up. We have our grease fitting for our Easy Lube axles, and this kit's designed for our Easy Lube as it's got a cap with an opening. So we could put this on and open that up there, but I like to do this first. That's the little rubber that lets you access this. It's really more for maintenance in the future. If you don't have Easy Lube axles, you would have wanted to ensure that this was filled with grease before putting it on. So we're just gonna Start filling her up now with grease until we see grease squish out of our outer bearing. This can take quite a bit sometimes depending on the spindle and rotor combination and how much space is in there to fill up. And it's just starting to ooze out now. We can see it's oozed out all the way around. So we are done filling this one up. We can then go ahead and put the cap on, seal this grease up. so. We're not making a mess when we go to put our caliper on here in a minute. Let's just line these up and thread it on. Now there is a torque specification written on the cap here. However, most people aren't going to have a socket that is large enough to fit on this. And the big thing with this is just keeping the grease from coming out. There's a rubber seal here on the inside. So as long as we get it snug, we're gonna be plenty fine there. The big thing with these really is just not to over tighten it because it is just plastic. When we first started this job, you saw the ones that were broken off because those were over tightened. And that's, that's plenty fine right there. We're snug. Our seal is made full contact all the way around so our grease can't come out. We've now got the caliper that comes in our kit here. We want to make sure that brake pad's pushed all the way in. A lot of times in shipping it kind of just pops out of there. Just push that in. The slides here also sometimes are pushed towards the center and we need those to be flush. So if, they're, if they are pushed in, push on those slides. Same thing with the one over here on the other side, just push it until it's flush, just to make sure that we've got enough clearance for this to go on. We can then slide our bolts in and they are sticking through there a little bit. We're just gonna pull them back because they're gonna be in the way. We'll then just take our caliper, we're gonna slide it over our rotor. Each side should sit nice and flush here with our bracket and then we can take the bolts that we had slid in there and thread those in and then we're just going to thread these in i like to start each one by hand before tightening them down because sometimes when you go to tighten them down it might not be quite lined up and you'll fight getting the other one started we can then go back and tighten them down now that we got them started we're tightening them down using a half inch socket we can then go back and torque these bolts to the specifications found in our instructions. We can now repeat this same process for the remaining hubs that we have. And once you've got those on, the nut where we put that cotter pin in and everything, that when we loosen it and tighten it back up, that for the most part gets you set where you want, but it's a good idea after you've got all of them done, you can throw a wheel on here real quick and just see if you've got any play in the wheel. If you've got a lot of play, you may need to go a little bit tighter. Just a tiny little smidgen of play is okay, but only just a little tiny bit. 
We don't want to over tighten it though to the point where it's too tight and this is hard to spin. That's going to remove any play, but again, this has to be loose enough to keep our bearings from burning up. So just a smidgen of play to no play is right where you want to be. If you're concerned that you maybe got it too tight, loosen it up a little bit till you feel that play and then just go back up till you can get that cotter pin lined up. Now we've got these assemblies installed, you just got to hook up your brake lines, your hoses, and then bleed the brakes. If you're replacing an existing set, you've already got that done and you just hook them up and bleed them. If you need to add brake lines and an actuator, if you're going from an old electric system to a hydraulic system like we are here, then I would highly recommend Hydra Stars 1600 PSI brake actuator. And they also have brake line kits available here at eTrailer.com in various lengths for the amount of axles you have in the length of your trailer. So now we've got everything installed, we need to bleed the brakes. So we're gonna go ahead and remove the cap. Just go ahead and take it off and fill it up with DOT3 or DOT4 brake fluid. We're gonna be using DOT3, but DOT4 will also work and you can get it at your local automotive store. We'll then wanna fill up our reservoir and then we can begin bleeding the brakes. You will likely need an assistant when bleeding the brakes due to the length of the trailer. You kinda of can't be at both ends at the same time. We're now back at the passenger rear brake caliper. You wanna start at the caliper that's furthest from your actuator. Ours is mounted pretty close to the center, but since we routed the lines down the driver's side, that makes this one the furthest distance away. We're then going to bleed this one and progressively get closer to the actuator going in the order of furthest to closest, bleeding them. Bleeding them. We gotta ahead and take a... Now you don't have to use a little hose like this, but it can help minimize the mess as this is gonna shoot out of here with some pretty good pressure and you're gonna have a lot of cleanup. Brake fluid's very destructive on paint and other services like that. So you really want to try to minimize getting it on things. If you do get it on something, just make sure you clean it up right away. So we're going to poke this hose on it and go down to our catch tray down here. And when I loosen the bleeder screw here with my 5 16 wrench, I'm going to have the assistant pull the pin to start pumping the fluid. The assistant also needs to keep an eye on the fluid level because if the system goes dry, you have to start all the way over. So you need to make sure he keeps that topped up while you're doing this. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up. Go ahead and pull the pin. Go ahead. You can see it shooting out. We're gonna go ahead and stop it. This already looks pretty good. We did gravity bleed it. We're gonna close it up. And since we didn't really have too many bubbles there, we can move on to the next wheel. We're gonna go ahead and do this one one more time just to make sure there's no bubbles. If you do see a bunch of bubbles going down your clear tubing like this, that means you've got air in the system and you need to continue to bleed until you get it with nice solid stream of fluid through here. Remember that assistant needs to keep topping up that reservoir as we go. So let's just do this one more time just to make sure everything's nice and clean. Go ahead and pull the pin. Oh yeah, and that is nice and solid. So we're gonna close it up, go ahead and stop. And you can see there's no bubbles in any of that. So we're just gonna pull that off and it'll finish draining down. We're now just gonna move on to the next one that's furthest away. Repeat that process at each one until they all come back with nice solid stream of fluid. Once you finish bleeding, you can then reinstall the cap. You don't want the cap on it when you're bleeding as the little rubber seal here can actually get pulled out and it could potentially damage it. So now that we finished the bleeding process, we're gonna put that back on and then we're gonna activate the brakes and check to make sure we have no leaks in our system. To check for leaks, I'm just gonna pull the breakaway pin and then I'm gonna check every fitting to make sure that there's no fluid coming from. You wanna check each one very thoroughly because sometimes it can be leaking out very slowly. So I like to actually just touch them and see if I get anything on my finger. We wanna make sure we check all the ones here at the brake calipers, nice and dry, as well as all the unions and fittings that we have here. Everything is coming back nice and dry. So we know we've got no leaks in our system. You can reinsert the pin now to stop the actuator. We just needed that actuator running to keep everything pressurized to make sure this could handle a fully loaded hydraulic system. And that completes our look at Kodiak's disc brake kit for 8,000 pound axles with a 13 inch rotor and an eight on six and a half bolt pattern.